Okay, this is uh, October 17th. And Anyway, October 17th, I'm in uh, my boarding house in Mabini, Negros Oriental. And uh, today, I want to talk about AA and memories. Um, so, my, and I haven't got into therapy over this kind of crap yet, or over these disturbing memories. Uh, but I got... I finally put a plug in the jug in uh, August 1st, 2008. And they told me don't make any big decisions for a year. I did that. I kind of just put my life on po pause and got and dug into the uh, 12 steps. And, you know, discovered a lot of things. Um, one thing that I discovered is I wanted to know the outcome before I did the work. It doesn't, and, and the program doesn't work that way. Uh, the other thing is, as I went through the step work, especially for step four, is step four starts reveal uh, for me. This is my own personal experience. Every alcoholic has their own their own take on it. But I started uh, getting, I started realizing how I will. Well, bottom line, I was full of resentments, absolutely full, top to bottom, of resentments, and the resentments were had all the power over my thought, my feelings, and my beliefs, and most of all, my action, or inaction, and, and in a way, I think I was just paralyzed in fear, uh, even before I got sober, I remember being in a limousine, going to a NASCAR race in Bristol, Tennessee, got really drunk, and for the first time in my life, uh, don't ask me why, but the I become conscious or aware of the power and the presence and the dominant and and the rule of of fear in my life. I mean, the emotion of fear. I was full of fear. I mean, um, toxic fear, like terror. I, I I can't explain it, but it's like I become aware that fear was controlling my every thought, my every action. My every feeling, uh, it was, it was, I was full of fear. And, and I didn't know, for whatever reason, before that moment in time, this was like 2003. I didn't get sober till 2008. Uh, but 2003, when I was in that limo going to Bristol, uh, I became aware of how fear was ruling my life, but honestly didn't know what to do about it. Uh, and I definitely become aware in that moment of having some very severe emotional trauma or emotional problems, and I didn't know I didn't know what to do with that either. Okay, so anyway, fast forward back to 2008, and then it's fast forward on when I I did the four my four step. Is four steps started showing me how how many resentments I had when I was working through my four step. I had a notepad with a pen that uh, I just took with me wherever I went. And any any moment, if if another resentment popped into my mind or, or a disappointment or things didn't work out like I wanted them to or whatever, I put I would pull the truck over on the highway and write it down because if I didn't, I just, I would free, when I got back home, I'd forget it. And it, I probably done that for almost six months. And I mean, I'm talking about stupid, petty things that had happened uh, 20 years before that. But neither, n none to say that even that, those little things accumulated. I always called myself the resentment accumulator because I just collected them, one right after another, you know. Uh, in fact, I, I felt like I, I tried to get my identity from my resentments. And then also my malicious behavior and thinking and actions were always justified on my re from my resentments. Uh, but anyway, when I started putting all that on a piece of paper, and then you start seeing 
your your you, what what the the first thing that I had done, which is the first time I'd ever done it, was actually uh, reflect on my own f- actions, thinking, behavior. My I looked I, I looked within internally, and I didn't like f- who I was, and I didn't like f- the person that I had become. I didn't like my attitude, um, and f- and I don't I couldn't sit there and tell you why f- I was like that. Uh, the self-pity, the self-loathing. I mean, the, I think that I had one passion, one life passion when I walked into the doors of AA, and that was self-hatred. I mean, I fucking passionately hated myself the way that uh, the, the step work revealed to me. And, you know, I mean, I, dude, I had heard for years as a drunk, man, you really need to fucking stop this. You need to do this. You need to do that. Blah, blah, this. Blah, blah, that. And, yeah, okay, I got it. I need to change. I need to do something. But I didn't know how. See, this is the difference for me with just people giving you random advice that they don't really know you, but it's obviously that you have problems and they want to say something to you. I've always found advice to be something that people shouldn't give because it doesn't involve any change and it doesn't really, I don't think it does any good. Now experience, different thing. Your personal experience can be amazing. But I come into AA thinking that I had life by the wall, I had life by the balls, I've, 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 uh, knew how to live my fucking life. I knew what what I wanted, but f- really, I thought I knew everything about everything. I was one of those know-it-alls. Yeah, maybe I was just uh, hiding it or denying it, but I thought I knew it all. And I, the longer I stayed in AA, I realized I didn't know f- I didn't know anything about nothing. And you know, I would go into a meeting. And I would fucking ruthlessly judge every person in there. Um, but f- what I found out men- on a mental level is I, I had created mental fucking defenses to protect myself from being hurt. Um, but a lot of this external f- was, was cre- uh, the thing that I'm talking about was created when I was a fucking little boy. Uh, because of the the fucking environment that I was growing up in, uh, to to keep myself safe and the will to survive. Uh, when you're a f- little kid, given the situations that were presented to me and f- I, the circumstances that I had to face, your your instinctive will to live and survive will do its best to protect you from death to protect you from harm it's just a natural instinct you know it's just like a turtle going into its shell if it feels threatened or danger it will withdraw into its shell even if it's a bulldozer track getting ready to run over it right that shell is not going to protect it anyway but it's just going to instinctively react to threat and uh Anyway, I got into that step work, went through that, finally finished that, and uh, to to be quite honest with you, I try to go to a priest. A priest uh, that you know they suggest go go to anybody you feel trustworthy that you can be open and honest with. The other thing that uh, that was step five, right? You admit to yourself, to another human being, and to your higher power. Not my higher power, but yours. It has to be personal. Whatever your higher power is which you have to have one, of your own kind. Now, there, there's atheists in AA, so, if, you know, but I think it has to be a power greater than yourself, whatever that is, okay? Not not your, not your thinking, because this, this is a prison for an alcoholic, this up here, the mind. So I called a priest, and, uh, yeah, he said, yeah, I'm, I've, I've, I've heard of AA, and I've, I've done those steps before. I mean, I've done that. So, you know, I... I mean, he he was like a salesman, you know, like he he could be trusted, and and so my understanding of a fifth step is that it's something I do, right? So I, somebody has to sit there and take it, receive it. 
So, and, and I'd been working on this thing. I had a lot of crap. I mean, I had all this, all these resentments and fears and stuff, all this negative stuff that uh, had accumulated over years of my life. And uh, I had it, I walked in there, you know, he was there, we had an appointment, he was there in his office, went in, and I, I said just a few things, and then I basically sat there and listened to a two-hour two pep talk. And I didn't get to say, you know, I didn't want to be disrespectful. First off, it's his, his office, and he's the pastor of that church. But for me, my understanding of the fifth step was that, you know, these are things I need to get off my chest. And I said just a few things, and he just went into his uh, marriage counseling mode uh, for some reason. Like he just picked, you know, it's like he picked a few things that I had had said, which I had not even started my list, and, and fucking rode with it. And I, and I just sat there and let him go on, fucking on. You know, I wanted, well, everything within me wanted to tell him, grab him by the fucking tie and tell him to shut the fuck up. But I can, conf- I can frame myself. I kept those urges within. And I let him go on and on and on. And I just sit there. And then afterwards, I go outside and I call my sponsor. And uh, I tell him, I said, look, man. I said, I just tried to do my fifth step. And I said, I, I come over here to talk to a preacher. And I said, basically, I've, I've just got done with a two-hour fucking te- te- pep talk. Which, quite f- f- for me, was utterly useless i might as well sit there turned on a a a radio and listen to two hours of fucking chinese or chinese music or jeff it it meant fucking nothing to me now maybe it would have meant something if i was learning chinese but it didn't hope i mean he just wasted his breath and i and i probably should have just stopped him but I, I fucking didn't. I just sat there and bared it. And I think, God damn, are you ever going to fucking shut up? I almost fell asleep. Uh, so that approach to me is use, is the most useless approach I've ever seen in my life. You know, just shut the fuck up, man. Uh, but uh, so anyway, my sponsor said, well, Dave, you know, hop in your truck. I'm here at the house. Come over here and I'll fucking take it. You know, I'll, we, we'll do it here at my house. And I'm fucking scared shitless. I'm just a little fucking coward, a little, I'm a spineless fuck, and I, I go over there, and I'm going up to his, his I parked off, off the street, walking up to his front door, and I'm fucking sh- terror, I'm scared as fuck, um, I don't even fucking know why, I really don't understand why I was so fucking scared, but I was petrified, Almost to the point of, of being, fr- like, just standing there froze. But anyway, I, got, I made it up there, knocked on the door, and we, we went in. We just we went to his kitchen, made some coffee, you know, nonchalantly. And then uh, we went into the living room and, you know, back a little bit back and forth. And I think we did, we actually did the third step prayer first, which is where I surrendered my will and life to the care of God as I understand him to and to ask him to take away my difficulties that you know if I can uh, well that it can demonstrate his power and all these things and if, you know if I, the, I really had struggled with the, the higher power not because I don't believe in him but because all of my fucking life since I was a little kid I have felt uh, deserted by God for the most part I mean these these emotions and these fears are so fucking powerful they're 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 old yeah you know, like they've been with me since I was only seven or eight years old like fucking since I was a kid and it's really fucking hard to get rid of those old things thinking and old beliefs uh when when they feel as if they are so real even though they're not and i know god hasn't fucking deserted me i know that i know it's like knowing and believing two different worlds okay or knowing and 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 
and practicing, I guess. You know, I can f- know how to do heart surgery, but it's a world apart from walking from walking into an operating table with a real fucking human being's life in your hands and you doing a procedure. Totally different thing. I can sit here and know how to do it, watch videos about it, but anyway, so I sat down and I, I'm literally still fucking shaking. And honestly, I wanted to fucking drink so bad. I, I, want, I think if I'd had a, a bottle of J, Jim Bean, I could have given two fuck less what he thought about that. But I, I was so fucking scared of what he might fucking think about me if he saw that or if he knew that. And it, to me, and it may not even been that dark or evil or wicked or anything. But for me, that fucking experience was bringing me out of a place of severe isolation where I didn't feel any connection to anything or anyone. Uh, you know, my friend often told me, he says, you, he says, some people in this world are born without a conscience. And he says, I think you're one of those. You don't have a, a conscience. And it's like, well, I do have a fucking conscience, but it's been murdered in the when I was a kid. Um, so anyway, did my four step, and so help me God. Now it, it it I didn't feel this radical. I didn't feel angels from heaven come down, and I radically become this other fucking human being. What I did feel like is that now now I can actually fucking go back to living my life. Um. From, from before that, I don't. I wasn't fucking living. I don't know. I was reacting. Everything about me, from top to bottom, was just one massive reaction to something. I. I it, it's really psychotic, I guess. Or it, it. It needs to be dealt with by people who have some uh, tra- like a psychologist. But anyhow. I finally got through, and it, it was good. I said some so fucking shit in there, and he'd say, yeah, okay, good, what's next? Like, we just fucking went through it like a punch list. And I was so fucking terrified of being known or just being fucking honest. It, it just wasn't the way I was brought up. Honesty equaled death when I was a little kid. To be transparent and truthful and honest we will fucking kill you was the underlining message I was raised with. So I, I didn't even fucking know how to do it. And I felt very unnatural and very count, count, counterintuitive uh, to try to do, to try to be honest. And, th- and it was very, very liberating though. I felt like when I, I felt like I had one of those Navy, uh, what's that? That sea bag. Literally, the size of a sea bag, full of big rocks from the river. And I walked in there with all that fucking shit on baggage. And, dude, it felt like I had taken that fucking baggage off, and I walked out of there. I walked out of there fucking 200 pounds lighter. I felt free to live again. And I felt like if it was a process of cutting things cutting myself free of all the disappointments in life of all the betrayals in life of all the of all the the hurt or the conception of hurt of all the fucking cheating and betrayal betrayal was a big one disappointment was a big one man i was fucking you know count uh, uh, keeping score counting counting points on people and uh whew. and i you know i remember having this 12 year old resentment that i'd been fucking ca- ca- dragging on for for years in my life and and I, I think another thing that i realized became aware of and even till today i still struggle with was just letting go of things and people it, it almost every single thing uh all of those resentments in step four always were attached to people and relationships whether it was a romantic relationship a a academic relationship with my schoolmates a a relationship with my coach or my parents or people whatever type of fucking relationships you could think of 
And and in all fucking quite honesty with you, I felt like I was growing up in public. There was a part of me that I had to fucking hide to survive and and live as a kid that was now finally getting a chance to come back alive, come back to life, and now start to finish what you put on pause when you were fucking seven years old. There you go. That, that, that is a very f honest way that I can explain the whole thing. I didn't want fucking people to know me. I was very fucking terrified of people. Okay, so anyway, after that, uh, life went on. And uh, I didn't make any big moves for a year. But I want to kind of skip a lot of my story to get to these specific memories, very disturbing memories that started coming into my consciousness or I, I, I began to to start fra putting these fragmented memories back together the uh, of a very painful and disturbing experiences when I was very young um, and maybe they had always been there I don't know uh, a psychologist might be able to help me help me understand if it's a suppressed memory or repressed like it but but anyway so i had been sober four years and i think this shit was it four years yeah yeah it was like the summer of 2012 i was in my condo and the funny thing is these memories come to me in my dreams at first and then i would wake up and i would start remembering Okay, uh, remembering these events that had happened. And I think the reason God brought these back to my memory is because they had such a impact on my life. And they were still having a f impact upon my life, even till today. I mean, I'm talking about today, right now, today. And the, the one memory that I had was of, of being in bed, and when I grew up, we always had Saturday morning cartoons. Uh, on We had three channels on the TV. We had the old rabbit ear antennas. And I grew up with, a, we had an RCA color TV. Um, I remember waking up. You know, you got to have something to look forward to. Well, my as a little uh, eight-year-old boy, the thing that I was looking forward to is watching Saturday morning cartoons. I love Yosemite Sam uh, and the Road Runner and Daffy Duck and uh, Bucks Bunny. I live. For, I love those guys. <laughs> Yosemite Sam was probably my favorite, one of my favorite cartoon uh, actresses. And then Tom and Jerry and the Old Dog, if you remember those. And my kids, even till today, like watching those. Well, we've not watched them for a while. I might try to put them on and see, but uh, they were watching them, but I don't know if they've kind of got over it now. But uh, anyway, so I come into the living room, turned the RCA TV on, and it was sitting right in front of the fireplace. Uh, we had an open, uh, open fireplace. And uh, sat down. It's probably 9 a.m., 9.30-ish. Turned on the TV. I, you know, I, I, there's nobody around. And I heard my mother in the kitchen. She was on the phone, I think, with with uh, my aunt, her sister. I don't fuck. I don't know who she was on the phone with, but uh, we we used to have one of those old rotary phones that hung on the wall, and then she had this 20 or 30 foot phone cord. So she could work in the kitchen at the same time being on the phone. We didn't, we didn't have wireless cell phones with speakers where you could just set it down. You could just set it down and um, and talk. You know, you put it on speakerphone and hear what they're saying. This is long before that, and anybody that grew up in that period would know that. Um, so anyway. She was in there rolling biscuits out, biscuit dough for for breakfast. She was going to put in a pot of biscuits, and we always had biscuits and gravy growing up, uh, Southern style food. And if you're from some other part of the world, you you won't know anything about that unless you Google it. Um, but anyway, I've turned the TV on, and I have uh, till till today. She's already dead and uh, passed, but. 
uh, for whatever her reasons was, she come into the living room. She hung up the phone, whoever she was calling, talking to. Come in the living room, picked me up under the armpits, and started twirling me in the fucking air. I thought that, I thought we were playing. I thought she was just playing with me. And I thought this was supposed like a you know just she 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 loved me and she's fucking playing with me and she's twirling me in the air. And then all of a sudden, with all her might, she fucking let go of me, and I hit the wall above the living room sofa. Like I'm talking about, she fucking threw me in in a rage of violence. So, so for me, your natural, I think your natural instinct is to trust your mother, to to love your mother, and to to, to go to your mother for safety. And this was not what this was about. This was not. This was not a play role where we were playing together, having fun, mother and son. I don't know what it fucking is. I mean, I need somebody else to fucking explain it to me. But she she span around, and I, bear in mind, this whole thing was, there was not one word ever fucking spoke. And what I find funny is uh, what Darren Hammond says is this silent contract. The the victim agrees never to say anything about what's happening, and so does the perpetrator. And there's nobody around. There's no fucking witnesses. They, one thing that I know for sure about her is she never wanted a witness to what the hell she was fucking doing to me in secret. Okay, this is just a thing, a one-on-one -on -one thing between me and her. I mean, not even my sister was around. My sister was never around except for one attack. And uh, and and it was because of her they stopped. So anyway, um, I fall to the sofa, and uh, I sit there for a minute, and I get up to go, and and I approach my mother, and she's just standing there angry. You could tell she's very pissed off, but you don't know why she's pissed off. So she grabbed me under the arms. Went around, started twirling me in a 360 degree. I mean, my body was elevated up off the ground, like like you're throwing a in the Olympics. I forgot what this that that is. So anyway, uh, and then she throwed me against the wall again, above the sofa. I mean, I hit I hit the freaking wall. I fell down to and hit the top of the sofa down into the sofa and then turned around and sat properly on the sofa and the second time I was getting more fucking um, confused because uh, I began to realize this is more is as if I'm being rejected like uh, as losing my trust in this this female this this woman was not safe to be around she's violating my safe my, my sense of safety so I get up, walk over to her, and she fucking does it again. You know, spins me around in fucking violence, like, like in, like I like for for no no provocation to my part that I know of. The only thing that I had done is come in the living room and turned on the TV. And uh, other than that, I, nothing had th that I remember I had done wrong. So she throws me against the wall again. I go I crash down on the top of the sofa, sink down into the sofa, turn around, and I fucking sit there for a long time. I'm not going to get up anymore because whatever's happening here is not. This ain't playtime, and I lost all fucking trust for her at that point. She was she no longer had my trust. I didn't fucking trust her the rest of my life after that. She wasn't a safe person. So, uh, and after I'd been sober for four years, this this whole episode started coming back into my awareness or my consciousness a little at a time. Okay, and then another attack I mean like I've, I've had several like it's chronic it's not just one isolated event it's not like you were in a car crash and, and that happened fucking 20 years ago and you remember that one accident so this is the first one I'm telling you about the first one that started coming up into my fucking awareness my memory I don't know if it was suppressed memory 
and I had created this t- total fucking fantasy of what happened when I was a kid, but it started coming up. Uh, but with no emotion. See, I still feel like I'm even till today detached from the emotional uh, repercussions of those events. I feel frozen. I feel shut down. I feel detached from how I fucking feel. All these th- words I've learned over the years from studying psychologists that primarily deal with developmental brain trauma, which I've, I think a lot of this uh, could be connected to that and just abuse. But anyway, the third time, I just sat there and I think to myself, if she's going to attack me again, I'm going to have her come pick me up. She's getting tired too, you can tell. I'm going to have her come pick me up out of the couch and, and she can fucking, you know, like I was I was going to be submissive. But she don't. She stands there for a long time. I swear to God, it felt like 30 minutes. She finally turned around and walked back to the fucking kitchen. And after a while, you know, I kept, I like, in that fucking moment, you know, well, let me put it this way. If you were in a public environment of some kind and and you had just been treated that way, your automatic thought is get to get away. Get away from the threat. But when you live with the threat, there's 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 two two parts to this. When you live with a threat, okay, you can't fucking escape it. I mean, you could try to, you could try to hide, but you're living with the fucking threat. It's not the same as packing your bag and driving away or running away. Okay, so uh, the the psychological dynamics, actually three parts. The, th- the second part is you're in a developmental fucking phase of your life. You're eight years old. Your, your brain and your physical body, your emotional body, your spiritual, every component of your being is not fully matured and developed and grown. So it's in a phase of development, okay? The other part is the threat is not some Taliban or Viet Cong or some fucking dude far away in some country you don't, you can't even barely pronounce shooting at you and your fucking buddies. This is a the most intimate woman in in your life. In fact, it's probably the only woman you know other than your grandmother or aunt or something like that. Do you feel me? So, it is one massive mindfuck, um, you know. So anyway, finally, after a while of sitting there, I got up. And honestly, at this point, I don't know where I stand. I don't know who I am and where I stand or where I belong. The other thing is you don't have no sense of belonging, so I kind of tippy toe. Now the, the the living room was here, and you tippy toed over to the kitchen area, and uh, it was a open way. There was no door there, but it's it's just a breezeway. But it's, it had a door frame, but no door on it. And then I kind of stood there first, looking at the refrigerator, and then I I kind of went this way until I made visual contact of my fucking mother. So. Uh, I peep in, and this is, bear in mind, Every I want you to understand that everything that I'm elaborating on right now, I couldn't even remember until 2012, but th- this event happened in 1982, or 83, I think it was 83, I re- I'm pretty sure I was 8 years old for some reason, I, I keep remembering 83, I fucking lean in there. Mom went back to making her biscuits. She had one of those wooden rollers that you roll dough out with. And she is fucking rolling it back and forth. I have no idea what was in her mind. Her state of mind was un- unidentified. Okay? And then all of a sudden, I mean, I don't know if she sensed my press. She had her back turned to me. I don't know if she had her sense about her or if she was psyching herself out to come back in the living room and and murder me, kill me, finish it, finish the job. 
Because that's certainly how I fucking instinct, my instinct told me this. He's rolling it. All of a sudden, she takes it by the right hand and she raises that fucking roller above her head and she keeps fucking slamming it into the kitchen countertop as if she was trying to psych herself out to a point to, to, to kill me. You know, I've heard, I've heard, I've watched uh, murders, serial killers. Uh, where they said they had to sock their self out to do it. And then once they made that first blow, the rest of them, like, they just go into some, like, I've, I've heard of people being stabbed like 30-something fucking times. It's because there's just, there's just so much fucking internal rage. And they just keep fucking, I mean, the person's dead already. Yeah, but they can't fucking control it. So anyway, she, uh, at that moment... I feared for my life. To be quite honest with you, I didn't know if I could make it to the back door before she clubbed me in the back of the head. I thought she, I, I went kind of slowly to the door so she didn't hear my presence uh, and slowly opened the door, but I was hoping to get out outside the house before she could catch me. Because I, what, what, I, what I had, what I visioned in my mind was that she was coming behind me with that, with that roller, and she's just going to, you know, beat me to death, bash my brain in, bash my skull in, fucking be done with it. I mean, and I, and until this day, I mean, the woman died in 2015. But, you know, if you can ask the question, why did she do that? I wish I fucking knew. I don't know. She had mental problems. She was schizophrenic. I don't know because the family never took any action to get her properly medicated or treated for whatever it was happening in, in her life on a personal level. Okay? But I do know that these events really made it hard for me to make boundaries. It, it really fucking made it hard for me. Like talk, uh, talking right now helps me identify me and identify her. Uh, because part of my survival technique as a kid was mirroring her fucking behavior. That kept me alive. Now, if I, I feel like it's destroying my life. Like now, I find, I find that survival skill completely useless, you know. Uh, but it's still fucking there. And I don't know how to get rid of it and freedom from it. So anyway, now bear in mind, this is all happening in sobriety. Now, when I was a fucking drinker, this kind of shit, I would just get drunk fucking over. I'd, I'm going to drink over this and, l and let it wash away. Hopefully, just wash it away, but it don't. Uh, alcohol, I turned to alcohol for many, many years to do thousands of things for me that it never fucking done. It never got me my old girlfriend back that I was too much of a coward to f tell her how much I loved her. It never got my fucking job back that I fucked up. Because of my own stupidity, it it, it never fucking did any, uh, any of the things that I ever wanted. It just uh, it made me think or believe that I didn't have emotional problems when I really, I really fucking had massive emotional problems. Because uh, I was a crying drunk, guys. If I get really fucking now, some guys if they get really drunk, they're going to tear up the house, beat up their, their wife, uh, beat up other people. You know, kill somebody, but no, I'm a fucking, I'm an instigator and a crime drunk. I'm going to fucking ball up and cry like a little fucking child for hours. And if, if you ask me why or what for what for, I can't, I can't, I, I don't know. I can't tell you. It's like all of it's in there, but I, I, I can't fuck, I'm, I've shielded it, blocked it off. Okay. I finally get out. So back to this memory in 2012. I finally get out of the house. I run into the field behind the house to two little dogwood trees. Sit down below it. And I don't want to say that I was having a panic attack. Of course, my heart was racing. The adrenaline, like I, it was, it was like being in a fight and then survive, running away and surviving. And you're sitting there. But, at, but you're an eight-year-old boy. You're not a grown man. And you're sitting there trying to process what the fuck even just happened. So it wasn't long. I think she knew I was outside. 
she come up to the gate of the field. Now the grass was really tall. The, at the time, the grass was over my uh, about neck high at my age. It, the grass may have been three and a half, four foot tall. So I heard her yell out the back door. Now she hadn't. Uh, uh, so when she, when I heard her fucking voice, I was fucking terrified because the first thing instinctively, my instinct was to say, "She's coming for you." And in fact, you even said her, it's even better now because you're out here in the grass. She can fucking kill you out here and nobody will find you. So I got up out from under the dogwood tree and run out into the field of grass. Just way out there is about a 10 acre field. And I just laid down flat on my belly. And then what I done was I got up just enough to where my head was right at grass level. And now whether or not her eyesight was good enough to spot me way out there, I don't know. I never knew until this fucking day. Maybe it was. Maybe she saw me straight away. I don't know. She, She's fucking evil. So anyway, I kind of got down where I could look through the grass. And I, she had come up to that fucking gate. She kept calling for me. And I couldn't see. It was so far away, I couldn't see if she had that fucking roller in her hand. But I thought, I honestly thought at that moment, I'm about to die. This is the last few hours of, of, my, of my life in this world. And she kept doing that. And then, anyway, she started making her way out to the field. There was a tractor tire, like a trail, uh, that went, kind of went through, through, through this one field and then went into another field in the back, so... As she, she started walking down there, I just got fucking down on my belly. And she came out there, and then she walked past. past me. I, was, I could hear her tra- uh, yelling. She walked past on the trail, going to the back field, and went way back there and yelled. And I felt safe then because I said, she ain't going to fucking find me. And then she come back and kept yelling, and then she, she went back to the fucking house. So I said, thank God, fuck. So after I saw her, uh, she went through the gate and went back down the hill. I felt safe enough to get up. And I sat there for a while. And then I got up and uh, I was making my my way, it, way back to that dogwood tree. And then I, I don't know how much time passed. Now, this was all in one day. I do know. It, it, it was the whole fucking day that this all transpired. But internally, it feels like th- my fucking true self is still stuck there. So, and bear in mind, this is the first memory that really come, in, the first shit that really come up in my awareness, okay, that, that I had fucking buried or tried to forget about, which one therapist said that's, that's the natural thing is to just try to forget about it. But he said, this kind of thing isn't, isn't something you can forget about. You have to process it and, get, and then get freedom from it. It's, uh... So anyway, I went back to the dogwood tree, sat there. And I want to say that I sat there for an hour or two. What I, what I think I've done is I sat, I sat there until lunch. And during that little time frame, I kept... Th- <laughs> there used to be a cartoon where a guy uh, was uh, like a hobo. Or uh, Goofy, I think. He had a stick with like this uh, kitchen apron with all of his stuff in it. And he was just, he run away from home. And I remember then, in that time frame, thinking or remembering that. And thinking, okay, I, can get, I need to find me a stick and get that apron and go get my things and then run away from home. And I'll be out of here. Like, I didn't feel like... I felt like uh, from that attack, I lost, there was, I didn't have a fucking home after that. She she had fucking rejected me and abandoned me, my mother. Uh, and I still, till this fucking day, don't understand, I don't know why. <laughs> I didn't do nothing to her. I never fucking beat the hell out of her, like some kids. Uh, at least yet. So anyway, uh, I'm thinking about all these ideas how to get my stuff and run away from home. And I knew, I knew if I go back, I'm dead. And if, at that time in my life, in that uh, eight-year-old, it for me, it was a life or death situation. 
it wasn't a bad day. It was the last day is how I felt instinctively about what was going on. So anyway, if, after about lunchtime, I think she had lunch for me. And she's want me. She's trying to call me in to come to lunch. Well, when I fucking heard her calling again, I run. I get up. I don't even let her get up to the gate because I don't want her to see me. I run down this trail to the backfield. Now, the backfield started up at top of the hill and it kind of sloped downward down the hill to a big... Uh, big forest a big area of forest and then it was like a like a, a valley a cove and then there my dad had dug a pond down there it's like down in a low ground so i ran all the way down the hill to the very back corner i didn't go through the fence and keep going because i'd had to rummage my way through woods and stuff so i got down in the fucking corner of that field and i just sat down and i hit again like, I, I felt like I couldn't run far enough away. Even if I went to the end of the earth, it wouldn't be far enough away from her. So anyway, if, you know, if I could hear her yelling for me way off in the distance in the other field. And then she she came back to the backfield and stood, uh, stood up at the very top. And I was laying flat. Not, like, no way fucking hell this bitch is finding me. She's fucking screaming for me again. And, uh, like, I felt betrayed. I was betrayed. What she did to me that day. What she did to me that day wasn't just fucking punishment for some turning the TV on. It was, it was something that shouldn't have happened for sure. And I sure didn't fucking know how to handle it. So, anyway... She yelled and yelled for a while and then finally gave up and, and, and went and headed back. And then I waited there for a while because I didn't want, uh, I want to make sure this, 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 you know, all was clear. And uh, I heard her yell some more and then she come back twice and yelled some more fucking looking for me. And, you know, just imagine being a prison POW and you finally escaped the prison and then you're hiding and the guard's fucking shouting for you to, you know, come back, right? What, what, what would you think? Oh, yeah, sure, I'm going to come back for being in the cooler and getting fucking beaten and starved to death and I can't you look you in the eye. Uh, from that moment in, in my life, I didn't have a home. I didn't have a fucking family. And I couldn't fucking trust her. It's like the total rejection or abandonment. If, now, physically, it wasn't a band. Psychologically, emotionally, in every other way of the word, it was. So anyway, if I finally got up. I start making my way up to the field. And uh, she's fucking still hollering, screaming. But I think she finally just said, fuck it. Or she started get, getting scared or wondering what happened to me. And uh, I finally make my way back to that oak uh, dogwood tree. Sat down there. And she never made any effort the rest of the day to come look for me. That was the last time. Uh, what I think she done is she called my dad at work. But he didn't come home special for that. I don't even know if she ever fucking called anybody. I don't, I don't have any idea what she done. All I know is I, I was fucking safe out there under the dogwood. Well... Uh, and bear in mind, everything that I'm talking about, which I've been talking for 48 minutes, uh, it co started coming to me in 2012 in pieces. Th th it's like it, I didn't remember this whole thing all at once. It was just first off, it was in the living room. Then it was in the field. Then I remember going into the, to the back field. It's like piece by fit piece. It, it's like... You know, it's like you get a piece of a plate, yeah, and then a few weeks later you get you find you find another piece of that broken plate, and it, you find where it fits together. That's how it fucking come back to me. Uh, and I wish I had. I need a therapist or somebody that understands what the hell I'm even going through and all that, and and then how to fucking process it and move on with my life. You know, uh, get 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 therapy done and out of the way if if it's even possible so anyway 
about 5 p.m. I know, I know we probably had a day, an hour of daylight left. Um, mom and dad come to the field. And I know dad is talking with mom. They're kind of having a fucking argument. But, of course, mom's not fucking being honest with, with dad. What the fuck she has done to me while he's been off at work. And I, I, I kind of pissed off at my dad because I think my dad knew his gut do things are my mother is fucking hurting me. But I don't think he knew how to handle it himself. And so he just kind of buried his head in work and just just ignored it. Like if, ignoring it, it just makes it better. It's the way to deal with it. And don't talk about it, whatever you do. Don't bring it out in the open. So anyway, I remember sitting there in that dogwood tree, and I had calmed down by this time. I was fucking pretty calm. In fact, I, rem I think I remember falling asleep during the hours. Like I stayed there 2, 3, 4, you know, 5 p.m., 4, 4 or 5 hours out there. I never ate lunch. Never had no fucking lunch that I remember. And now, I, you know, I can't, how much of this I'm remembering accurate, I don't know. Oh, but anyway, he thought, I remember, I remember him and mom come to the gate. And then they fucking started coming out there together. And I got up and started fucking running. And I was, I stood there on the field. I stood there on that little tractor trail. Because I was going to go back to the back field again. And I believe my father, my father sensed or recognized that I was scared of my mother. And he even, I remember him even turning around and saying, what the fuck did you, he didn't say fuck. He didn't cuss. Dad, Dad would never say a cuss word. He might say damn it every once in a while. But he turned around and said, what, what did you do to him? And mother always played the innocent card. Like I did, I did I've done no wrong. Innocent, innocent ignorance. I done no wrong. What are you fucking talking about? I did something wrong. What? Why are you even saying I did something wrong? You know, like that. So he told her. He instructed her go back to the house. So when I when he when she made her way back to the house, I felt safe enough, or I didn't feel threatened. So I went back under the dogwood tree and I sat back down. And Dad slowly approached me. Well, now I'm going into this rapid thought process. Should I trust him or shouldn't I trust him? Should I fucking uh, should I open up and tell him what happened or shouldn't I tell him what happened? Right? I was having this internal dialogue or debate. Should I or shouldn't I fucking tell him? Right, because earlier I had prayed to God to get me the hell out of here, and that fucking did no good. God deserted me. God didn't even fucking hear a thing I said, because I was still here. I even thought to myself, people talk about you should pray. When I when I was under that dogwood tree, I remember saying a prayer to God. God, please get me out of here. Let me come back to you. I didn't know the concept of death and let me die at that age. I don't think that I, I was, my mind was too underdeveloped and immature. The only thing that I knew to say to God in sincerity is, God, let me come back to you. If this, I've had enough. <laughs> if this is life, this, if this is life, it, let, me, let, me, let me come back to where you are. Maybe I'll be safe there. And, um, but nothing happened. Uh, you know, it, it felt like my prayer was ignored. And really, I just didn't know what to, what else to do. All I knew is I was in a very dangerous place, my friend. I mean, fucking very dangerous place. And I'm very lucky. It's only, and honestly, it's only by God's power somehow, and I don't know how, that he let me live. Now, did it change Mother? No. Mother did not change. She still, she was, Mother was, the, the, let me let me uh, psychoanalyze mother to the best of my ability without being a professional. Mother was a four like a four year old girl, locked in a in a woman's body, 
that was very fucking sadistic that needed a toy to play with. And I was that toy. She tried to, that was the defined row. When, when I was in private with mother, I was her toy, her pet, her amusement piece. Okay, if, if you want to look at me when I was an eight-year-old boy, from my mother's perception, that was her perception. And when we were in secret, that is the fucking role play that was expected of me. And one of the things mother always got off on, I mean, she might have cummed onto this. She might have had her own personal orgasm. She loved overpowering me. She liked to pin me, constrain me, let me wiggle. It was like a cat and mouse. You see a cat, uh, they got a mouse in its, in its mouth, but it's not dead. The cat could fucking kill it at any second. But it leaves it alive, and, it, and it'll sit there with its paws and, and play with it. I felt exactly the same animal instinct, animal nature with my mother when I was a little boy. It's very fucking evil. And nobody listening to this would consider it evil because you weren't there to witness it. See, there was no fucking witnesses. Oh, and, and the, the other thing that I can't stand when people, because people can't accept or believe that a mother has the mental or physical or the even the willingness or interest in doing such things to their own fucking child right that doesn't seem normal or natural so they automatically think oh you you're just making up this big grandiose bullshit you're so full of shit you're lying okay fine if you want to think that that's fine with me but that is not the truth that's not the truth uh for me it was it was a it was a godsend that I could even remember it. And I had to go through a lot of pain work and grieving and healing in those four years of recovery to get to the, to, to even get, dig deep enough to get to these memories is the way that I feel like it. Uh, so anyway, let's get back to that. Dad comes out. He approaches me very careful. He can tell that I'm very fucking scared. And he said, I remember he had his work, his, his work pants on blue, blue, dark blue pants. He always wore kind of dull color pants. Like he didn't wear pants with a lot of color and light and positivity and positive energy. He always wore, you know, black or gray or dark, dark green, dark blue, like that kind of stuff. It was, that was the energy that you kind of got from him. And he come out there and he kind of stood over me with his hands in his pockets and he said, uh, are you okay, son? You know, but I never felt like he put any heart into it. It was more like, I, anyway, at that point, I, st I honestly don't know what to do. And I start, I break down crying. I'm not fucking talking. I'm not, and I, I, I'm not crying like with my voice. Uh, there's just fucking tears flowing. The pain, in, internal pain of being rejected or abandoned by your own fucking mother. I don't think there is anything more, anything worse for one child, whether it's a, a boy or a girl, to experience such a thing like that. And uh, so I just, I start fucking, uh, I just lose it. Like The tears are just flowing. And it, it, it really touches my heart, my dad's heart. I mean, he could tell I'm obviously really. So he fucking sits down. And I'm sitting here thinking, how, how am I supposed to even explain what had happened? You know, it, it's like it's like one of those situations you can explain to somebody. But number one, they'll never understand you, which maybe a lot of people hearing this will not ever understand me. Uh, unless they have been through the same thing. If they've been through something like that in their self, they're going to know exactly what f meant the, the internal components of such thing of, of experience, okay? So, you know, and one, I guess one of my biggest fears in life is the fear of rejection. I've always had a deep fear of rejection. And I've always tried to take very elementary measures to protect myself 
from excuse me from rejection so anyway f um, I try to explain to him that mom hurt me that's all I could really say you know I, I, you, you can't articulate yourself how, how well can you arti articulate yourself when you're eight years old it's not very well <sighs> so if, he hears me out, and he, 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 he tries to console me a little bit, but then I think he'd had a hard day at work, and he wanted to go in and get back to his routine. And this whole thing was disturbing Dad's routine. So he got up, and he, he starts walking back to the house, and he wants me to follow him. And I follow him for a little while, until mother mother come back up to the gate. I saw mother and I fucking take off. I I, I start fucking as soon as I saw mother I'm running, man, because I I know I'm going to die. She she will fucking murder me. And we're not talking about giving you a spanking. And uh, this is murder. She will fucking end your life. At least that's how I thought about it and felt about it at the time. And when I, you know, there was a woman in Houston had five kids that she drowned, all five children, and she, the the last child actually run from her, and she actually chased the fucking kid down, and some overpowered the kid, even though he's a teenager, I think, and took him back to the bathroom and 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 drowned him in the fucking tub, then called her husband and said, "There's a problem with the kids. You need to come home." After drowning and murdering her own three, five, five fucking children. Okay. So anyhow. And, and when I heard that story, I'm thinking, man, God, God, thank you. I know there is a God. And now God, the other part of about I, I get angry with God is why God did you give me a fucking mother like that? What if you knew if you saw the fuck shit she's going to put me through? Why did you even let me be born in this world? <laughs> you know, and and certainly born in this world to this this woman that she she did she needed to fucking die. Certainly didn't need to be having no fucking children. But anyway, so when when I seen mom. Back to this story. I, I'm, I'm getting. I'm always getting off track, and I apologize for that. I think it's a part of my ADHD. It's hard for me to keep on on something. Um, that's another reason I used to get so fucking drunk. When I get drunk, I can have a conversation. I can uh, listen, follow, and be engaged in conversation. I, I don't know what it does to my mind, but it, se that, that it, it seems to work that way uh, for a point. But when I'm sober, I can get fucking incoherent. All right, back to the story. So I keep keep chasing, getting off, off, off the rails. So Dad starts walking back. I start following him, and I'm fine just to follow him as long as Mother's not in the picture. But that's not happening. Uh, mother... Starts coming up the hill to the fucking gate. When I see her, I turn around and I boat it. I fucking run him. And he he questions her it again. He says, what the fuck? And she won't be honest with him. Uh, until today, I don't know that he ever fucking knew what she really fucking did to me. She she kept him in the dark. And... Uh, so I run back at, back to the fucking dogwood tree. Well, this time it's dad's fucking pissed off at me. He he gets belligerent and angry and like he don't want to fucking have to deal with this. You know, or he don't fucking know how to deal with it. So he he just grabs me up. No, he grabs me up and kind of strong arms me and forces me to walk next to him. Well, Mother is standing there at the gate. About about halfway there, uh, no joke, I passed out. I literally fucking passed out on the ground in fear. Or it, it's kind of like an animal that's about to die. It, it it would just it would just fucking pass out. 
in, in, in my understanding of that day and those moments, that's what happened to me. I was just, I just fucking embraced my fate. Death is imminent and just give up. Give up to the fucking point I couldn't even walk. And I, f- I fucking collapsed. And I had to lay there. And, and, f- and instead of being dad being fucking comforting and sympathetic and taking me to the hospital or doing something to protect me, he he's he's jerking me around like he he thinks it's I'm it's all an act. But what it what he's ignorant. It's, it was actually a fucking bodily reaction to imminent death. Um, you know, I've heard combat soldiers talk about uh, some guy that was in combat that would fa- talk a, re- a lot and loud, but then when they actually actually got into the killing and the fighting, he would collapse in total fear or terror. Like he he just curl up in a fetus position like a ball. And that moment when I was a fucking kid, I feel like that's exactly kind of my response. It was just more than, more than I could fucking process, and um, something I couldn't get away from. And uh, that day really defined that every day from that day till today, and on an emotional level or a developmental level. And. Um, uh, uh, dad kind of got me up and I was so mentally f- broken from it or something happened psychologically like it, it just uh, I felt like I lost my, my I felt like I felt like I died that day my physical body was still alive but my spirit or my soul died so anyway dad dad puts me on his back you know, so I've got my arms around him, and he's ho- he's got his arms around his back, holding me up, and walks back to the house. And I want to correlate what happens in this moment of time. Uh, when I got back to the back porch, still still on Daddy's back, <coughs> and Mother is fucking standing there. I want to take a minute. And go into the AA program. So in the AA literature. It talks about having a vital psychic change. In in our thinking. Our emotions. Like uh, Dr. Carl Jung talks about it. Where you have this massive shift. Of emotions and ideas and thoughts that dominate. It's like you change. From the old to a new. Kind of like a butterfly being born from a caterpillar, right? It just breaks through the shelf and it becomes something new. Well, okay, now let's go back to that when my dad brought me back to that porch. I want to fucking tell you that I had a psychic change in that fucking situation. The psychic change involved me, whatever I got to do, to I stopped growing I stopped fucking developing, and that that was I. I tried to kill that part of me, or put it or or put it bury the true self, or put lock it away, lock it away where it couldn't be known or seen, and it's as if I picked up a mask and started wearing it from that moment and it was that psychic change what I would start imitating my mother's behavior uh, I would hide uh, I st- I, if she believed something I would believe it like I, I you know it, it's like um, what I've read about POWs in combat if, if they will to survive they will actually take on traits of the of the prison of the prison guards, they will start fucking mirroring it, uh, just to survive the bru- brutal assaults and abuse and torture and all the other things that they have to go through, that are just indignant to human beings. And I want to say that from that moment forward in life, until a few years later. Uh, I wasn't myself. It's like I 
David died that day. David fucking Norman died that day. And then I just went into survival mode. Uh, I would mirror her thoughts, her behaviors, and decisions. But that wasn't enough to stop the violence. She still kept hurting me over and over and over again. But I want to end because there's more thoughts and more experiences that, that kind of have a span time of about five years that I want to document one at a, one at a time. Okay, the main reason I want to fucking document these things is first off, it's it's a voice for the silent. Uh, it's bringing a, a voice to things that had happened that shouldn't have happened. Uh, nobody was there for me. I didn't have a, a moral ally. See, I found it in AA. Al AA, I got an ally. I got somebody that's really got my fucking back. When my girlfriend leaves, my wife leaves, when I get fired, no matter what happens, AA is there for me. And that's what I love with the, 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 the literature. Anytime a suffering alcoholic needs help, the arm of AA should be reached out to help that guy, no matter what. And if it wasn't for AA, I would not even understand the concept of love and the concept of family. I wouldn't even have, a, I'd be completely fucking oblivious to what either one of those concepts even mean and even should mean. I, don't, I didn't fucking, under, I, did, I wasn't raised in a home that taught those things. Okay. So I want to end. Uh, the next episode will be the next memory that, and, and these memories just started coming up, but there's still the, the detachment from them. I've got the memory, but the emotional part of the experience is is too much for me. I, th I think it's even till today, it's too traumatic to assimilate. I have relived the trauma several times. And the best thing I could explain, it's as if you're in a state of being murdered and terror, but there's no end to it. You feel like you're being murdered. And terror, and terrorized, and you feel like you're in the process of dying. The fear is so intense. The emotion is so overwhelmingly powerful. You know, you feel like you're a little kid, and there's a, a freight train. The the power of it is so overwhelming. It's more than you can fucking even handle or or explain. And then, like it's like a psychotic break. You go through, you go through it, and sometimes it takes fucking days—a mental break, uh, where the 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 fear. It's like a like a tsunami wave, right? It takes time for the wave to subside, and it takes time for the wave of fear to subside when you relive a fucking trauma like that. And. Uh, Peter, I forget the guy's name, talks about an emotional flashback, which is what I try to live in almost every day. But, uh, yeah, I've relived that trauma, and it felt like the, the fear subsides, and I'm given, I'm given myself the freedom or the privilege or the right to continue living. It's almost like before it happens, you don't even have the right to be here. What the fuck are you doing even being alive? Uh, now these are deep, deep lies or deep things that you've been telling. I've been telling myself since I was a little boy, you know. But bear in mind, at the time it served its purpose. But now, as a kid, adult, it has no value, uh huh, except just fucking up my life. But that's enough of that memory, and uh, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna stop this video and start another one. And you know, I would appreciate. I know this is just a monologue, and this whole thing would be probably a hell of a lot more meaningful and constructive or helpful if I would have a discussion like a, between me and a therapist or something or some other, some other perception and perspective other than my own. This is probably dull and boring. Uh, and it's probably just putting people to sleep. But what I hope is that this video can somehow be found 
by other adult men who have gone through this with their psychotic mothers. That's what I want to help. I want to help other grown men that went through these type of things when they was a kid or other grown women. Grown, I've I've met I've had girlfriends that that's went through this almost similar things with their dad. If you watch, I tell you what, if, to give you a, a video, a movie clip that really kind of captures this memory that I've just rambled on and on about. Right? What get to get the old movie Forrest Gump. Fast forward the movie to where Forrest runs over to Jenny's house. It's just a run-down farmhouse. Knocks on the front door. Nobody is there. Nobody answers the door. Nobody comes to the door. And he runs around the side of the house. And he sees Jenny in the backyard standing there in her little purple dress or pink dress. I forgot. He runs up to her like he's oblivious to anything being wrong. And Jenny is kind of staring off in space in a daze as if lost or confused or bewildered I, I, there's a lot of I don't know which word best captures her state of mind in that moment and then all of a sudden there's a ruckus in the house and her father's shouting for her and she she goes into action she grabs uh forest his arm and they run through i think it's a tobacco field or a corn field one of the two and she's running down the row and then she cuts cuts across and then she's running down some more and then cuts across and her dad belligerently he's a drunk he he comes out there in a fit of rage uh running through the running through the tobacco field looking for her and jenny gets down on her knees and gra- and forces uh, Forrest to get down even though he's got these uh, uh, crutches on or w- these brace leg braces and she says pray with me Forrest pray with me Forrest and I said dear God please turn me into a butterfly and help me fly far far away dear God that if you want to if you want to capture what I just what I just spent an hour and 17 minutes talking about that is what happened here but it was a little bit more involved than just saying a prayer to god to make me a butterfly i said a prayer that god just just bring me back to you i didn't feel at home there so maybe if i'm with god i'll feel at home if i'm with god so thank you for bearing with me to let me get that out to get to make it a record that's something I don't think I've ever shared with anybody that I've I made public, I've made known. And you, you, you know, if, if it doesn't really interest you, or you think I've made the whole thing up, you know, I've just pieced it together from other things. That's fine. But the truth is, my truth is, I'm a recovering alcoholic. I've been sober 14 years, and after being sober for four years. That memory, along with several sequences of memories that I'm going to continue to make more videos to, to elaborate on each one of those, happened between I was age 8 and 13 in that time frame of development and age in my life, personal life. And I almost drank myself to death. Uh, I want to say I was trying to commit passive suicide by alcohol. Okay, I wouldn't hang myself, wouldn't blow my brains out, uh, wouldn't jump off of a bridge or walk out in front of a train or s- truck or something. But I was, was trying to fucking kill myself with alcohol the way I consumed it. I was drinking to oblivion. God spared me that that horrible death as long as I maintain my spiritual condition. And uh, I'm here today to share this, and I and I hope this helps another alcoholic. I, well, the only reason I made this is to help somebody else. If it doesn't help you, thanks for hearing me out. If it does help you, put it in the comments and hit the subscribe button and try, uh, you know, try to give me some comments what I should, what what I could do to make a better a YouTube channel. Um, and you know, a a topic that you'd like to hear me talk about. 
uh, I've I've traveled 25 countries now in the world. I mean, uh, you know, I've I've got to do a lot of traveling. I've I've mostly lived a nomad life because I've never felt at home anywhere I've been. Uh, the, I'm like a gypsy. But anyway, that's enough for this, and I'm I'll pause and uh, take a break, and then uh, be back in touch with you guys later on. And I I hope you you'll watch it and give me some feedback. I hope anybody can even find it. Okay, I'll pass.